You've ruined my life! I, I do apologize about that, Pete. On the surface, well, Brother Where Art Thou appears to be a Three Stooges-like movie of pure nonsense. But if you look just a little deeper, you will realize that beneath its faded yellow patina is a movie about power and light. The title of the film is taken from the Preston Sturgis 1941 film, Sullivan's Travels, about a movie director who wants to film a movie based on a fictitious book called, Oh Brother Where Art Thou? I want to make Oh Brother Where Art Thou? But I'll tell you what I'm going to do first. In the end, spoiler alert, after going on a journey of self-discovery, the director decides not to make the movie after all. In Sullivan's Travels, it's the movie that Joel McRae wants to make. Um, so this is, you know, we went ahead and made it for him. The fictitious book title, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? is most likely a reference to old gospel hymns with names such as, Oh Brother Jesus, Where Have We Left You? The story takes place in Depression-era Mississippi, right before this portion of the country is hooked up to hydroelectricity and introduced into a more modern age. It is still a time of strong superstitions and belief in the supernatural. I'm not sure that's Pete. Of course it's Pete. Look at him. One of the things pushing our characters is the knowledge that a dam is being built, which will flood the area where a treasure is supposedly buried. We got but four days to get to that treasure. After that, it'll be at the bottom of a lake. Based very loosely on the Odyssey, the Coen Brothers' Oh Brother Where Art Thou is a movie about a quest, but not a quest for stolen loot, as we are led to believe at the beginning of the film, but a spiritual quest, as the title implies. The film starts out with Everett, Pete, and Delmar escaping a prison chain gang and meeting a blind old man who seems to have prophetic powers. His blind eyes are filled with light. She must travel a long and difficult road. This oracle cryptically tells them what lies ahead on their journey. But most importantly, he tells them one very strange thing. You shall see a, a cow on the roof of a cotton house. <laughs> George Clooney's character, Everett, represents our modern day society. And one of them, a know it all, can't keep his trap shut. Obsessed with his appearance. My hair. Pete, the personal rancor reflected in that remark, I don't intend to dignify with comment. And doesn't believe in religious, quote, superstitions. Well, I guess hard times flush the chump. This is demonstrated when Pete and Delmar decide to get baptized but Everett refrains, saying, Baptism! <laughs> you two are just dumber than a bag of hammers. Later, they pick up a guitar player named Tommy, who has just sold his soul to the devil. He did a small world, spiritually speaking. Pete and Delmer just been baptized and saved. I guess I'm the only one that remains unaffiliated. This ain't no laughing matter, Everett. What'd the devil give you for your soul, Tommy? Well, he taught me to play this here guitar real good. When asked what the devil looks like, wondered, Tommy's description like? just happens to match the sheriff that is pursuing them. Sweet summer rain. He's white. As white as you folks. With empty eyes and... Like God's own mercy. Big hollow voice. Ain't love to travel around with a mean old hound. The boys stop at a radio station in hopes to make some money recording a song. Who's a hot show around here? I am. Who are you? Uh, well, sir, I'm Jordan Rivers, and these here are the Soggy Bottom Boys. Jordan Rivers is, of course, a reference to the River Jordan, where Jesus was baptized. We hear that you pay good money to sing into a can. And the name Soggy Bottom Boys is yet another reference to baptism. The radio station operator is the second person in the movie that they've met who is blind. The blind are reputed to possess sensitivities compensating for their lack of sight, even to the point of developing paranormal psychic powers. But instead of seeing into the future, this man holds the power of influencing the masses, which even the governor of the state recognizes and utilizes. They broadcast me out on the radio. Why ain't you gonna press the flesh, Pappy? We ain't one at a time in here. We're mass communicating. Oh, yeah. That's a powerful new folk. The story takes place during the lead up to an election, and the two candidates competing for the votes of the people 
mirrors the supposed competition for souls between God and the devil. What can I do you for, Mr. French? How can I lay hold of them soggy bottom boys? There is also competition to find the soggy bottom boys. Hot damn, we gotta find them boys and sign them to a big fat contract. And sign them up for a recording contract. Oh, mercy, yes, we got to beat that competition. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pete and Delmar, although portrayed as idiots, are actually demonstrating to the audience, if not Everett, ways to align with God. It's a straight and narrow from here on out, and heaven everlasting's my reward. It is telling that after Pete gets captured by the sheriff slash devil and has a noose around his neck, he cries out, God forgive me! And the sheriff immediately stops the lynching. Later in the movie, Pete makes the same plea. God forgive me! I could not gaze upon that far show. And once again, he is immediately saved. This time, by Delmar and Everett. Staying much longer. A revealing scene into Everett's character is when they meet up with the fast-talking Big Dan. I don't believe I've seen you boys around here before. Allow me to introduce myself. He represents the Cyclops from Homer's Odyssey. All of those who are pressed for time, Big Dan, Toot Corp. Everett immediately hits it off with him. A detect like me, you're endowed with the gift of gab. I flatter myself that such is the case. And Big Dan promises to show them how to make vast amounts of money. Sales, Mr. McGill, sales. And what do I sell? The truth, every blessed word of it, from Genesee on down to Revelation. And Bible sales. Which, let me tell you, there is damn good money in during these times of woe and want. Big Dan is somewhat of a reflection of Everett. They both represent modern society an information age that is coming. An age where we have lots of information, but don't know how to interpret it. We thought you was a toad. We, like the saying goes, are blind in one eye and can't see out of the other. Bible sales. Now the trade is not a complicated one. Especially when it comes to spiritual matters. Both Everett and Big Dan agree that Bible sales are a good way to use people's ignorance to make money off of them. Big Dan takes Everett and Delmar to a remote location and then attacks them and steals from them. Delmar, the one usually depicted as less intelligent, fights back while Everett just sits doing nothing until he gets clubbed in the head. The point is made that Everett's own reflection, his modern society ways, are harming him and he doesn't see it happening. Perhaps he is the one who is ignorant. <laughs> Seeing the funny paper. <laughs> Everett finally admits to the other two that there isn't a treasure. There ain't no treasure. But, so, where's all the money from the armored car job? I never knocked over no armored car. He just needed to escape to stop his wife from getting remarried. But when he no, finally sir. gets to her, she isn't interested <laughs> and has told everyone that he has died. Why are you telling our gals I was hit by a train? Lots of respectable people have been hit by trains. Judge Hobby over in Cookville was hit by a train. Penny, you stop that. No, you stop it. Vernon here's got a job. Vernon's got prospects. He's bona fide. What are you? We learned that the reason he was thrown into prison was for practicing law without a license. I'm going to be a dentist. I know this guy will print me up a license. You Once again, he represents our modern, dishonest, quick-fix society. She isn't impressed until later when she sees him as part of the Soggy Bottom Boys and realizes that he is bona fide and has prospects in at least one area. It is important to note that there are seemingly two endings to this movie. The first comes after they sing Man of Constant Sorrow for the crowd and those listening at home. Well, then I say, by the power vested in me, these boys is hereby pardoned. Which is interesting because the only reason their group is any good is because Tommy sold his soul to the devil. This demonstrates that fame and worldly success in the eyes of man can be achieved without being bona fide in the eyes of God. They soon are captured by the devil 
and his hound. End of the road, boys. And are unable to escape this time. You have eluded fate and you have eluded me for the last time. Tie their hands, boys. You can't do this. We just got pardoned by the governor himself. It went out on the radio. Their graves are being dug. Is that right? And coffins are prepared. Well, we ain't got a radio. Satan isn't bound by the laws of man. God have mercy. Finally, Everett, seeing he has no choice, drops to his knees and begins to pray. This is what the whole story has been leading up to. And this is what Everett has been running from. I know I've been guilty of pride and sharp Much dealing. like Jonah in the Bible. I'm sorry that I turned my back on you. Forgive me. Everett admits his pride and asks for mercy. Help us, Lord. And mercy comes in the form of a giant wall of water. It rushes in and saves them from Satan. And at the same time, finally baptizes Everett. They have now been physically saved and spiritually. They are square with the law and with the laws of God, power and light. They were buried in the watery grave, and yet they now live. They have been given a new life, a spiritual rebirth. O brother Jesus has been found. A coffin pops up out of the water, which normally symbolizes death, but they grab hold of it to stay alive. Much like baptism, it represents both death and resurrection. A miracle! It was a miracle! Elmer, don't be ignorant. But Everett, I told you they was flooding this valley. Realizing that he isn't going to die, is quickly blinded again and immediately tries to explain everything away. There's a perfectly scientific explanation for what just happened. That ain't the tune you were singing back down at the gallows. And he almost gets away with it until he sees something he can't explain with logic. A cow on the roof of a cotton house, just like the old prophet foretold at the beginning of the movie. And that is the moral of this story. And stay out of the Woolworth!